Welcome back to Film Studies with Michael. I'm your host, Michael. There are few films that possess the sheer animosity to a central concept like Batman and Robin does. It is reviled. It is 21 years old, in fact. Blackjack, be it the writing, the acting, the nipples, the character design, the tone, the nipples, the Clooney, the directing, the set design, the nipples, and just however the hell we canonically same universally got from this to this. The hockey team from hell. Because, yes, these are the same connected series and universe just simultaneously evolving in tone so dramatically that Whiplash is now but a flesh wound from a fruit fly. But what if we had it all wrong? What if Batman and Robin wasn't a movie at all? What if it was... Many Omens? Let's talk about Batman and Robin, George Clooney's 47th best movie. Sorry, Return of the Killer Tomatoes, and we are coming for you, rumor has it. To describe the tone of it cleanly would be impossible. To describe the tone of it with chaotic, incongruent descriptors would be apt, if not uh, at least a little bit without merit considering the effort involved. So I'm not really even going to try. Batman and Robin is guano, baby. It's batshit. Batman and Robin was a 1997, uh, sure I'll go with the term film, directed by Joel Schumacher, who I will remind you directed Falling Down just two years before this, where he was nominated for the Palme d'Or à Cannes, and written by Akiva Goldsman, who won an Oscar for A Beautiful Mind six years after BNR in 2001. Movies are not made in a vacuum. Oh no, there are many factors that have led us here today. I'm going to illustrate what happens by illustrating what kind of production it was. To remember Batman and Robin as it should be. As guano, baby. Hang on tight, this one's gonna go fast. The cigars Arnold is smoking in this movie are real cigars, Cuban, in fact, and brought to set for him by none other than his friend John Bon Jovi. Yeah, this is gonna get a little weird. I think that fact is fairly widely known, or at least reported, and follow me down this rabbit hole. Arnold was paid $25 million for this movie, and a lot of the reporting kinda went after him for it. And that's not entirely unfair considering the result, but his top of the heap paycheck for this movie is only half of what Jack Nicholson was paid for the original film, or 50 million smackaroonos. Want more depressing Batman facts? Sure you do. Hell, Michael Keaton only got $11 million for reprising his role in Batman Returns, and the shit of it all is that they only paid Michelle Pfeiffer $3 million for what I think is the only truly iconic role in the bunch. And she had that leverage only because it was a last minute recast from Annette Benning, who had to leave the production. Also, Annette's paycheck was only gonna be one million? Pfeiffer used that last minute fact that the studio was totally screwed without a Catwoman to get three million. Yup. But back to the main point now that I've dropped us down the sludge dungler of depressing paycheck movie facts is that obviously it's pretty not super cool to just insist that you be allowed to smoke your Bon Jovi cigars in what is clearly meant to be an enclosed hermetically sealed space for a body under contamination precautions. Which then would mean requiring the art department to hastily paint Bon Jovi's Cubans as white ice cigars or whatever, and kind of abandon having the suit really mean anything. Oh, you're just gonna, you're just gonna smoke, you're just gonna smoke that in a, a bathrobe? Okay. Sure, he's a villain based on a really good backstory from the TV show, but kind of jettisoned with his real interests outside of saving his wife being cigars and puns. I hate when people talk during the movie. That's the kind of shit 
that gets people blacklisted. That's the kind of shit that ends your career. Insisting your character be allowed to smoke cigars brought to you by someone who wants you dead or alive? I mean, what? But he wasn't blacklisted, not even close. In fact, it didn't really seem to be that big of a deal to anyone. So here's the chaser. To get that hot smurf mouth effect on screen, Arnold had a bunch of tiny LEDs in his cheeks that were, well, they were hastily assembled. The extra saliva in his mouth, no doubt due to wearing 75 pounds of metal husband costume, caused the coating on them to melt away and short out in his mouth. Oh man. Not only leaking battery acid all over his teeth and gums, but that specific thing had to be repeated throughout the entire production as the LEDs failed one by one. And that happened constantly. The LEDs should have been in his mouth for the entire production, but you can see that it's only random scenes. And that's not even mentioning the fact that he was in those blue ass contacts all day that sucked the moisture out of his eyes so bad that Arnold just appears bloodshot for the entire movie. This production really messed him up. And suddenly, I don't care how bad his lines are because it turns each and every one of them into a f***ing miracle. If I must suffer, humanity will suffer with me. They consistently leaked battery acid into his mouth while suctioning the moisture out of his eyes for 12 hours at a time as if that was a reasonable expectation or frankly even something to allow your actor to do. I mean, at that point, the least you can do is rewrite the character to allow him to smoke his Bon Jovi cigars. God, the fact that this movie even exists is a miracle. I just think this one's kind of interesting. Batman and Robin is one of only three films in history to feature two U.S. governors in it, Schwarzenegger and Jesse Ventura. Yeah, he's really only in it for a hot second as Arkham Asylum Guard. The only other two films, by the way, that also feature two U.S. governors are Predator and The Running Man. That's an omen. Facts are weird. I have to describe the tone? That's it's gonna be impossible. I don't. Ugh. Okay. Um. The tone of Batman and Robin is a 100% accidental shot in the dark, breathed to life by relentless studio actor and producer notes throwing back to Adam West era Batman through the lens of 90s extreme Todd McFarlane ass designs. In a word, it's perfect. Batman has a bat credit card? Never leave the cave without it. This asks a lot of questions. Oh, you thought the room was funny for making every wrong decision? Welcome to the major leagues of, they did what? Out of context, Batman and Robin's tone makes Superman 4's seem, well, just downright reasonable. This is why Superman works alone. I think Batman forever got away with a lot. Somehow we accepted that as tonally in the same zip code as Batman and Batman Returns. Partly because Jim Carrey was the hottest performer on the planet at the moment and partly because, I mean, okay, I was 12, I, I didn't get it why it was weird to suddenly throw most of the way back to the 1960s TV show. But did you know? Batman Forever was the first feature film to ever make $20 million in a single day. They were basically told to lean into every worst instinct they had, and, and, then, and then they did. Can you even imagine what would have happened if the third Batman movie in the Chris Nolan trilogy was suddenly directed by Paul Verhoeven? Tim Burton was followed by Joel Schumacher. Exactly what that sounds like would happen, happened. It's incredible. This movie had deadly decisions at practically every single level. Why is Poison Ivy wearing drag makeup? Who knows? I've fallen so far into the Batman and Robin rabbit hole that I just respect it at every conceivable level because you couldn't repeat this disaster if you wanted to. Oh, Mr. Freeze needs tons of diamonds as fuel to make cold, cold stuff cold? Driving on arms? Wait, what? Okay, driving on 
arms. This is a film where the narrative time is spent on Batman worrying that Robin isn't ready to take the necessary risks yet, but but driving on arms. George Clooney plays every scene as if Bruce Wayne believes that lesser humans should not even share his air. If someone is talking, he's like, what is this noise? George, what are you doing? I appreciate when you can dig into a film and get something else out of it. The more you can do that, the more value a film has to me, good or bad. And Batman and Robin is spelunky. I adore this movie. It never stops delivering. This particular garbage inferno will never happen again. That's like 57 more omens. It's too many omens. This is an impossible franchise to speak with any finality about. It was a connected series kept in continuity by Alfred and Commissioner Gordon being played by the same actors in all four films and carrying plot lines between them. But we're here today to celebrate the life and subsequent passing of the Burton Schumacher franchise. We're gathered to remember Batman and Robin. This is a film of many omens, bright flashing emergency lights in the road beckoning one to alter course lest they join them in the afterlife, but they steadied on to franchise heaven unabated. I come before you today paying homage to the deceased with candor, respect, and joy. How could I celebrate the deceased without seeing it in the proper context of the franchise? Batman Returns had a rocky as hell release. It made $266 million, which at the time was gangbusters, but parents groups went fruity pebbles over that thing. Batman kills a lot of people. Everything is strange and gross and weird, and there are numerous reports of children leaving the theater traumatized and bawling. Catwoman rules, but what am I even supposed to take away from that movie? It was problematic enough that despite making a lot of money, it was time to move on from Tim Burton to Joel Schumacher. That's the sentence that exists. Burton was actually pitching a third film to the studio and realized mid-pitch that they didn't want him to make anymore. Marlon Wayans was signed to play Robin as far back as Returns and he actually got a lot of residual checks as a result of that contract despite never being in a Batman movie. Robin Williams was super interested in playing the Riddler and they wrote the script with that in mind. And Billy D, well, he was finally going to play Two-Face, so actually Burton's third film on paper is pretty much what Schumacher made in Batman Forever. On paper, not in tone. And I like that Joel Schumacher was the only live-action Batman director to make a movie with kids in mind first. To me, that's worth something and makes sense. Up to a point, I mean, it absolutely devastated the audience, but I respect where his head was at. I see what they were trying to do based on the lessons learned from Batman Forever. In modern cinema, the Batman franchise has lived and died three times, assuming of course that Batfleck is actually gone. The secret of a Batman franchise is solo films and by proxy, toys. That's why everyone always has their own vehicles, good and bad. The studio was less interested in films after the original Batman, and they were way, way more interested in merchandising and toys. And in my opinion, there is no one, no one in comics with a rogues gallery as deep as Batman's. That's why the villains always made substantially more money than the person playing Batman at the time. In BNR, Schwarzenegger is given top billing above Batman. And Batman as a franchise survived all of this with flying colors. That's how forgiving that brand is. The Phantom, eh, not so much. It went quiet for a bit and then returned with the third highest grossing trilogy of all time behind Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. All things being honest, I think this movie is so bad it's good. Once you know why this rickety drawbridge of heinous decisions was made, it's pretty suddenly the most watchable comedy you'll see this year. Like there's a ridiculous reason for why stuff happened the way it happened. You know what's amazing? Here's a big statement. I think Arnold tries to actually do something here as an actor that he's never tried before. It's incredible to watch. Arnold goes for it while swallowing battery acid. I mean, none of it works in the traditional sense, but it is just so damn entertaining and weird. He fully embraces the 1960s zany. You will not find a more ridiculous Arnold performance. Batman and Robin is my The Room. 
I can't believe any of this happened. I think it's important we remember movies like this. Enjoy them for what they are. Not adjusted for inflation, Batman Forever still made $10 million more worldwide than the Lego Batman. Yeah. But if we are gonna adjust for inflation, Batman Forever is the fourth highest grossing Batman movie ever made. And I choose to remember Batman and Robin anyway, omens and all. Because it's guano, baby. Grab some friends, I think you'll enjoy it. Just embrace the madness. Hello, hello, hello. This was a weird one. I hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to ScoopFest18 for having me a get as a guest and my friend Casey Egan who flew down to tell me all the secrets about Batman and Robin. I'm actually gonna thank my top patrons this time. Brosfiend, the city of Son of God. David McIntyre, Matt Hesinger, Zach Marsh, Ken Burns, John. Don't ever ca count John out. John's here to stay. Uh, names have a max of 67 characters, and I'll be damned if I don't use them. Ooh, ran out of characters before you could get all in there. Hello. Hello. Follow me on Twitter. I'm very funny. M my mom told me. <laughs> At Mikey Face. Uh... A lot of new names, Mike Hurley, Victor Ken, or Quinn, I'm not sure, Sazzle, Stacking Keys, Willie Shenmeyer, Brian Kalichi, or Kalisi, I prefer Kalisi. Um, please like and subscribe, well I guess like the video and subscribe to the channel, don't subscribe to the video, that would be weird. Oh my god, Soft Mayo Punch is already in my credits, holy god. Uh, if you are uninitiated one, you need to start watching Deep Dive, uh, like right now. Please, please, that would be very good. Uh, Soft Mayo Punch is a, ma a joke I made in the episode we released like three days ago, or I guess when this was up like five days ago. Either way, that's impressive. Um, let me know if you want more stuff like this. Uh, if Scoop Fest wants me back next year, I have no problem making this a yearly thing. Uh, the, the movies that were up for vote were, were all pretty tragic. Except for Kroll. Kroll would have been nice, but, oh well. But, like, Spice World was on the list. Like, basically they could vote on what movie, like, what bad movie they wanted me to do. And, uh, they chose Batman and Robin by a staggering margin, which made my friend Casey very happy. Um, because we gotta watch it a bunch and laugh a lot. Uh... So, Carlin Kendrick, Charles Barker, John and Kenyatta Klein, Mike, Mike Laidlaw, Amy Berg, Liam Gallagher. You gotta get back to that Oasis thing, my dude. Matt Charles, Brady Alltop, Justin Holt. Yeah, watch it actually be <laughs> dude from Oasis. I'm gonna feel really bad. He lights me up on Twitter because of that. Uh, thanks for being a fan, Oasis. Uh, Trey Warren, Ray Johnson, Patrick Mahoney, Brad Hunziger, Walrus. Uh, a name that's been there a long time and I adore it so, so much. Uh, Cyclops Boy, Map, Jacob Koziel, Garrett Lathy, Kevin Hochter, and everybody else in the movies, Mikey Family, the film, Joy Family, goodbye, watch Deep Dive, bye.